Well, we are going to continue today in the book of Nehemiah, and this is our third Sunday in Nehemiah, and as we look at this book, we are going to see that Nehemiah, we're kind of doing a overview, if you have not been with us, and we're looking at what is happening, but our study so far has shown us that Nehemiah had a problem and it was a broken down walls. While it was a physical city wall and burned gates, we have said we today can make this real in our lives as we relate to individual broken down spiritual walls and in the church to broken down spiritual walls. We realize that we need to pray for our church We discussed our job as a Christian to be about the great commission of sharing Jesus Christ with the lost, unbelieving world. In doing this, we are helping to rebuild spiritual walls. And as we continue today looking at Nehemiah, there's several questions to think about. Do you have spiritual walls? that need to be rebuilt? Does the church, the body of Christ, have spiritual walls that need repair? Is the enemy winning the battle of the mind, of your mind? Is the enemy destroying relationships in the church? Or are we standing firm in unity in Christ as the body of Christ? Do we have the faith remembering what God has done, his promises, and in this do we stand firm in our faith, believing God will build? Do we have faith that he will rebuild our spiritual walls? Are we ready to build up the body of Christ in faith, working side by side. As we look at Nehemiah today, think about these questions. Where are you? Do you need walls that need to be rebuilt? Nehemiah was dealing with a broken down wall and burned at gates. We're going to pick up in Nehemiah 2, but in Nehemiah 1, just a little review that we have been talking about Nehemiah is Nehemiah is an Israelite, a Jew. He is in exile from his homeland in Jerusalem. He's actually with the Persian king, King Artaxerxes. He's a cupbearer. While he is a slave, while he is, uh, doesn't have freedom to do whatever he wants, he is in a great position. He is there with the king. And as the book of Nehemiah begins, he receives word of Jerusalem, which is bad news. He realizes the people are in great trouble and shame as the wall is broken down and the gates are burned. Nehemiah's heart is broken. He weeps and he mourns. He fasts and he prays for four months. He waits on the Lord. As he receives the invitation from the king to share why his face is downcast, in that moment after praying for four months, he prays again. He says to the Lord God to be with him, and he makes his request. And Nehemiah is a great planner, a great leader, and he is very specific in his request. And he asks the king to let him go back home. And we saw as we ended last week, verse 8 of chapter 2, and it says, And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. And so we're going to pick up in Nehemiah 2, looking at this, but we're going to skip all the way down to 17. And so we're not going to, as I had said before, we're kind of doing an overview here. And what's happening, though, in 9 through 16 is Nehemiah leaves, He goes and he travels, he encounters these critics, which we're going to see here in just a minute. They show up again, and they're going to show up continually through the book of Nehemiah. He encounters these uh, critics, these people that 
are against him, his enemies, and then he goes and he travels. He gets to Jerusalem. He takes again another period of time, this time just a few days to kind of wait. He gets from, it's a long journey, and then he does an inspection of the city. He does this inspection of the city at night, and he's trying to figure out what's going on. He realizes, yes, there is a truth, there is a problem, there are broken down walls and burned gates, and they need repair. And so we pick up in Nehemiah 2, 17. It says, Nehemiah speaking says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. You see, Nehemiah had traveled. He had been given the permission to go back home. And he went back home, and he goes and he examines the situation. He sees the situation. It is true. This is a problem. This is something we need to take care of. And then he speaks to the people. And this is something we don't, we can look and we can try to kind of say there's some different things we can look into and kind of um, think might have been the situation. But we really don't know exactly how Nehemiah had such authority over these people because he's a stranger. He's coming into town. He hasn't been there. And he goes in and he then makes this short little speech. But remember, Nehemiah had been praying and fasting and waiting on God for four months. God had worked in his life already before the king, and now he's before the people. And Nehemiah could have come in as many do and he could have come in, busting in and saying, this is what we're going to do, this is the way it is, listen to me now. Instead, he speaks immediately of unity. If you look in there, look at the pronouns that we see, and he says, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. He speaks of unity, and he says, this is what we need to do. And Nehemiah, he speaks, speaks the truth then in the next verse of who is the one that is leading him there. Who is the one that's going to do the job? And he says, and I told them of the hand of my God, that had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. He spoke again of God. He remembers, just as we saw in verse 8, he remembers of who God is. And if you're following the outline, the first blank there is he remembers, and we need to remember what God has done for us. To build up and strengthen the body of Christ, we need to remember what God has done for us. Nehemiah wept, fasted, and prayed for four months, and God answered his prayer. The king gave him blessing and authority. Now Nehemiah remembers and shares what God has done for him. I'm thankful for you sharing this morning, and, you know, it always amazes me. And somebody asked me recently about you know, theological truth and things that I know and learned and have known. And, you know, one of the biggest things, and this you won't find in any 
If anybody's ever studied theology and systematic theology, there's all kinds of different terms. And you won't find this one, but this is one of my best and favorites is, is that God is real. Now, you can look at all the attributes of God and find that, but I just am amazed when I see God do these things and work these things together. He basically shared kind of the sermon, a little snippet there. What do you say? I said it last week, and we're going to say it again. Is what is our job? To be about the Great Commission. To be about spreading the gospel and telling the good news. To be involved and to be a part of the body of Christ. And when we hear things as he shared this morning of his parents, and then others that we know of missionaries, and then He's continuing today and the work that is doing and that, that's being done there in these unreached people groups. And now there's reached people groups that all but one, right, that know Christ. That should get us excited. We remember what God has done. We hear of the things that God has done and we should remember and then have a great big faith to know that God is real. God works. I think of Joshua. And you can read it that in Joshua 4, that in Joshua 3, the Israelites finally get across the Jordan. And then God says, speaks to Joshua, and Joshua speaks to the people, and they get 12 memorial stones, 12 stones to set up and to remember what God did for them. It even says, so when your children and your children's children ask, what, what do these stones mean? You tell them that God and his power opened up the Jordan and we crossed over on dry land. That God is a powerful God. We remember what God has done. Again, hearing this story and then thinking of our challenge that we have made, and if you haven't been here for a couple weeks, is to remember that our church was founded in 1945. And we have taken a challenge of remembering what God has done for us, but praying for God to continue to do the work and praying at 1945 every evening, which is 7.45 p.m. We have, last week again, we took the challenge to remember to be about sharing the gospel. And as I just said about being real, I have a memorial myself. I asked you and I'll ask you again today, if you were not here, is to think of one person. And some of you, and I think of some of our missionaries, it's, it might be a whole group of people. But to pray for, that you can pray for them to come to know Christ. To realize the need for a Savior. And then to have the opportunity to share the good news with them. I've been praying for someone, and their neighbor, and sometimes it's hard to get the connection. I've been actually praying. I was praying to God, actually, after I gave the challenge to you. And I said, God, will you open the opportunity to be able to encounter the person, just to continue to be able to build a relationship with them, to be able to share the gospel. And this week on Friday, I went to the store, to Publix, and so I'm going to have to tell you, my son-in-law, Chuck, he likes this particular candy. It's called Swedish Fish. I never knew what it was. And so my sister, actually, a couple of years ago when I was dealing with um, uh, cancer things and I had to be in an isolation thing for a week, for about 10 days, two weeks, sent me these Swedish Fish. And... I started eating them, and now I've gotten addicted. So just a little st side story. So this way kind of, you know, that's a bad thing. But anyway, I was going to the store to get my habit of some Swedish fish and some other things, you know, necessities we need. And God, I believe it's God being real. Sure enough, there was my neighbor. And I was able to encounter and talk and kind of make that reconnection there. Now, we're in a store and didn't have the time to sit there and go through all the gospel, but I had that opportunity. We need to continue to pray for God to give us those opportunities and those connections to be able to build a relationship, to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. 
These things should make us excited. It should make us excited. We know that God is real. The things that Tom shared this morning, to know that God is working around the world. And it should make us want to do as the people said. We will rise up and we will build. We will rise up and build. And that's the next thing. We will rise up and build. What is our response to God's word? Is it our response to respond and say yes We will rise up and we will build. When we hear God's leaders say we have a plan and we have a direction, do we say we will rise up and we will build? And when they respond in submission, they say, yes, we will rise up, we will build. And then it says, so they strengthened their hands for the good work. Often we may see the broken down walls the burned gates, the difficult situations in our lives. We may see struggles in the church. But when we surrender to God, when we say, yeah, I'll rise up, I will build, I will be a part of God's work. As Tom said about that man that was standing off to the side. Are we standing off just watching? Or are we saying, I remember what God has done. I look at this church and all the history, and it makes me excited for God and who God is, and I will rise up, and I will build. And then my hands will be ready for the service to serve and to serve God. Our next item is ready, our hands for the work. We need to be prepared for the job. And when we hear these memorials, When we hear of God's promises, we should rise up and build. We should ready our hands, which is really ready in our hearts and our minds, to be prepared for the things of God. We talked last week about waiting on God in Isaiah 40. We know of that verse of 40, 31, but verse 28 says, Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God is the one that will do the work, and that's what Nehemiah says. But when we get excited about who God is, we get excited about the work of God, there's always the critics. There's always the ones that will challenge us. There's always the ones that will attack us. And we see that these three guys, and we're going to see them throughout the book of Nehemiah as we continue our study. And they come along and basically they say, try to use ridicule and deceit and say, come on, you're rebelling against the king. How can you be doing that? What are you doing? Why would you want to do something good for someone else? Why would you want to help these people? When Nehemiah, in the earthly realm, he has the king's authority. But he says it's God that will do it. And he resists the enemy. He resists the enemy. And we know of our New Testament that tells us in Christ that we can resist the enemy. James 4, 7 says that We submit to God and then we resist the devil and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5 tells us that we resist when we stand firm in our faith. Is the enemy telling you that you're no good and you're rebelling against the king? Satan wants to destroy our minds. That's where he starts. He wants us to be deceived He wants us to think we're not any good, that we're not doing what God wants us to do, that we cannot rebuild those spiritual walls. We need to stand firm. We need to resist the enemy. And then we need to be like Nehemiah. And we need to have major, big faith in our powerful God. Nehemiah identifies God as the one who will do it. At the end of Nehemiah 2, he says, the God of heaven will make us prosper. 
and we, his servants, will arise and build. And then of the enemy, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. We need to say God will be the one that will do it, and I trust in him, I have faith that he is the one, and he is the one that will repair the spiritual walls. We get into chapter 3, and we're not going to read chapter 3, but we are going to just cover it in that highlight view here. And I challenge you and encourage you to read chapter 3 on your own this week. But this is what I want to point out. In chapter 3, we see how they came together. They listened, they remembered, they heard what God has done. God brought Nehemiah there from a situation of exile, from being before the king. He brought him there after that prayer, time of prayer and fasting. Nehemiah said, come on, let's do this. Let's build the wall. We're in shame. Let's rebuild. And they rise up and they build. They say, we'll rise up, we'll build, and it readies their hands. It readies them and prepares them. They're attacked, they're criticized, they're ridiculed, and they, Nehemiah says, nope, you have no part of this. But God will help us build. God will be the one to build the wall. And then we see in, verse, in chapter 3, and again, you can go through it, but there's three words that are critical in chapter 3. Repair. It says 35 times that they will repair the wall. And then it says next, 15 times, and after, 16 times. What it's saying here is it says they started to build. And it says over and over again, it says that they starts with Elisha, the high priest. It says he rose up and he started to build. And then at the end of verse 2, it says, and next to them... And then on, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them. And And then it goes on, it says, and after them, and after them, and after them. The point is that they worked side by side, working together to build the wall and repair the gates. These were the Jewish people that had been in exile that now had come together and they were in shame because they were vulnerable to the enemy. They were in shame because this was God's place. And they realized they needed to build the wall, repair the gates for the glory of God. And they realized God will be the one to do it. This is a picture that we can see today to remind us of the body of Christ. And again, I just love what you said, and it goes right with this. Today, the boys and girls in Sunday school, different story. It was about Joe Ash and the king. It was talking about the church serving and being together as a body of Christ. It all kind of is that theme. And in the body of Christ... There should be unity, and we should work together. In the body of Christ, no one should be left out. No one is any less than the other. In the body of Christ, we all have a job to do. And 1 Corinthians 3 speaks a division in the church. It speaks of the body of Christ and how we all need to work together in unity to build up the body. And it says that we build up the body of Christ on the foundation of Jesus Christ. It says this in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If you're here today and 
you do not know Jesus Christ as your savior, then you don't have the foundation to build the walls, to build up spiritual wall of strength to know who God is. It says it has to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. You see, we are, as sinners, separated from God, and we need a Savior. And that one is the sinless one, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross. And the Bible says that if we believe that Jesus Christ came as the sinless one, and that he died on the cross for our sins to be forgiven, he rose on the third day, that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we'll be saved, and we'll have that eternal life. But for us that know Christ, we see here in 1 Corinthians 3, we see in other parts of the Bible in 1 Corinthians 12 about the body. We see in Ephesians 4 that we are all to be together to build up in faith the church. No one should be left out. No one should feel left out. But everyone should be involved and everyone has a job to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We need to build in faith, side by side. Maybe one of these, or all of these have, points have resonated with you today. And I want you to think about them as we close. To build up and strengthen the body of Christ, the church. And then us individually, our own spiritual walls, because then we need to come around one another as we are hurting. And to build up, we need to remember what God has done. Has God done something miraculous in your life? Well, let me tell you, if you know Jesus Christ, he has. But we need to remember what God has done. We need to remember what God has done for this church and rest in that and then get excited about it and then rise up and build. Get involved. Serve the Lord. Serve one another. Ready our hands and our hearts and our minds for the work. And maybe your walls are broken down because the enemy has been attacking you. Maybe he's winning that battle of the mind. We need to resist the enemy. Stand firm in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God. And then in all this, to repair the spiritual walls building side by side. Maybe as you think of repairing the walls side by side, building up in faith and in unity, you even think one that you need to repair a wall with. You need to make it more secure for our church to have unity with one another. Possibly there are relationships of disunity that need to be repaired. Let's remember, and let's rise up, and let's build. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that we can see in Nehemiah that he was continually relying on you. He realized, God, you are the one. You are the one that does the work. And Lord, in the midst of the naysayers, the critics, he stood firm. He said, it's God. God will be the one to do the building. And you that are against us have no part in this. Lord, help us to come together as the body of Christ. Help us to rally around those who are hurting, who have broken down spiritual walls, to rally around them and say, let's remember what God has done. Let's rise up and build and rebuild and repair. And for those, Lord, that may need to repair broken relationships and families, maybe in their job, communities, and Lord, definitely in the church where we should have unity that they would pray to you, Lord, for that opportunity to repair and to build up. 
And Lord, we thank you for the gift that we have in you, salvation, and that we can then be about busy about the work of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And we will see this church built up as we remember who you are, how great you are, that we would rise up and build, ready our hands, resist the enemy, and repair the walls to see revival in this church and this community. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.